Nick Black, and I've got my guest interview, Dave Miller. Thanks for coming, Dave. It's a pleasure. Now, we've got a very special guest who's come, oh, about two miles up the road from her <laughs> shop. <laughs> we've got Rosalie Edmondson, who is better known to music fans out there as Sandy Edmonds. Rosalie, thanks for coming. Thank you for having me. This is great. It's lovely to see you, Sandy. Yeah, you too. It's been a long, long time. Long. I won't embarrass the boat. With a stretched word, long. Uh, Yes, yes, yes. (laughs) It was way back in 1966, the last time that you and I were in each other's. Because I think I introduced you on stage at the Bowl in Castlereagh Street, Sydney. Wow, you've got and, a good memory. And at the same time, there was a New Zealand invasion because the pleasers came back. That's right. And it seemed to me that everybody was, was sort of coming back from New Zealand at that time. Were they on the show as well? No, they, they oh. did performances at the Bowl. And I know you did a guest appearance because at that stage, before I'd formed the Dave Miller set, I was actually sort of comparing and doing all sorts of things at the Bowl for Normie and all of those other characters. Yeah, and yeah, I introduced yeah. you on stage. A very special lady, of course. Oh, thank yeah. you. <laughs> well, particularly coming oh, from... there you go. Dave's That's pouring it on here. Yeah. <laughs> Rosalie, but you're not actually uh, New Zealand. You were born in Liverpool. Liverpool. Tell Land us. of the Beatles. My mother's Italian, mm. born in the Austrian Alps, and my dad was English, Liverpudlian, and they decided after a period of time that they wanted to move to New Zealand. So off they went, and I was heartbroken because the Beatles okay. had just exploded in Liverpool, and I was only 15 at the time, so I wasn't allowed to go out and club or anything like that. Oh, you never got to go to the cavern? Never got to go to the cavern. Oh, oh, much, much later. Did you have brothers or sisters? No, I didn't. So you're an only child? I'm an only child. But I was very fortunate. When I came to New Zealand, they did a tour in New Zealand, and my dad and mum let me go to the show. And there's me in the audience, so excited with my hands in the air, and I shouted out, up the pool! (laughs) Which in Liverpool is as, you know, is a very special thing to say. So Paul stopped and he's gone oi oi we got scouse in the audience and i've looked up and then the next day there's a photograph of me in the paper hands in the air shouting out so i thought that's my introduction to show business isn't it so i mean that was heartbreaking for me i mean to have to come out from liverpool but in the end it turned out to be absolutely wonderful for me to be in new zealand well yeah because you had a very unique career it's a very illustrious career it was a fun career those were the days so did you have any ambitions to be a singer not really no no, not really no so how did it start there was a little club called the delmonico over the north side and this particular day, I was about 16 and a half, or maybe 16. My mum and dad let me go to this. It was a coffee lounge on in the afternoon. So I got up and sang La Bamba. That was the only song I knew. Is that why you're so good at it? That, <laughs> that, that version on the disc, you have nailed that better than oh, most people. Oh, you're so nice. No, no, it's true. <laughs> Lyrically, I, you know, my, I don't know, the whole time. But be in the way, but you got it. Oh, thank you. But there happened to be someone in the audience that day that oh. thought I had talent. And came up afterwards and said, look, I'd like to meet your mum and dad, and did, 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 and then it started from there. It was a whole progression of me becoming a music, not a musician, because I'm not really a musician, but an entertainer. You're one of the legendary stars of the era. Oh. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. In New Zealand, maybe. Who was the guy who spotted you? John Peel, his name was. He's deceased. Heart attack years and years and years ago. But from there, Phil Warren was very interested in me because he knew, John knew that he couldn't take me to a certain place with this music. And so he got on to Phil Warren, who was kind of the man at the time that had all the connections. Did you know him, Dave? Yes, I actually worked through Phil as well, but he had a big track record in New Zealand because in the first wave of rock and roll he masterminded the career of Johnny Devlin. He had his own label, the Prestige label, and uh, that was the first big indie, so he was well in front of most contemporaries at that time. And you sang in front of a band called The Silhouettes? With The Silhouettes, yeah. And so who were they? Well, basically I wasn't with them. Occasionally I did something with them. I was really mainly on my own all the time, except when I came to Australia and after a period of time I decided to join a couple of different bands with different musos that were made up, jazz musicians as well, because I'd wanted to extend the musical ability yeah but back in the day there was lots of different things you'd go into your sessions you'd be doing two tracks remember that two tracks absolutely and three uh, hours to do it in (laughs) yeah. (laughs) yeah and then i did the first stereo album in new zealand well, you'll go down in history for that one. Did you have John <laughs> Hopkins yes. as your engineer? Yes. How did you find John to work with? I did as I was told in those days. Oh, you right, know. John okay. was pretty good, though. He was good to me, and I really didn't have... I suppose I, if I went into music now, I've got a lot more you know, yes, knowledge yes, about the course. industry, but in those days, being so young, so I, you go I, in uh, and you do as you're told, you know? Yes. Uh, I found him to be a sort of a lovable eccentric. Yes. This is my image that I would like to paint of him, the mad scientist in a white coat or something like yeah, that. Yeah, he was eccentric, yeah. for sure. But he yeah. was fantastic because... I, he was doing things that no one else was doing. Yes, absolutely. You know, so. Yes, and Brian Ringrose of, of my band, The Birds, in New Zealand, he rates him very highly too, learned a lot from him. Yeah, oh, we all did, I think. Mm. We all did. And how did Eldred Stebbing of Zodiac come into the picture? Was that because of Mr Warren? 
Yes, very much so. Did you know Phil Warren's reputation? Not no. really. When you're 17, you don't know. But my parents were kind of in contact with him about, well, especially my dad, not so much my mum, but my dad was yeah, a little bit weary of a young girl being involved in all this sort of stuff. My mum mm. was horrified into it. She was like, whoa, this girl's so young. But I think when things started rocking and rolling and everything was going quite nicely and everything was very well organised, that's one thing about yes, Phil. Yes, it was. Incredibly organised. Right down to pay packets on a, a nominated day each week. No one had to worry about no. taxes or anything. Everything was done for Everything. us. We just picked up our pay packets. Exactly. It's great. And That's very rare the in the music industry. <laughs> well, it is. Yeah. But it, New Zealand was very organised. It was, tremendously so, much more than Australia. i sorry I have to say that, folks, but that's true. I mean, you knew where you stood, your bookings, you got, you yes. got printout sheets, all yeah. sorts of things. You knew exactly where you were going and what you were doing. And what shows you were doing. You mm -hmm. knew when you were on, what time you were on. Mm -hmm. You know, it was very, very well organised. Mm -hmm. And he got a high-profile gig after he left show business, didn't he, in New Zealand? Who's that? Phil. Yes. But was he the Lord Mayor? I can't, I, I can't really answer that. I know that he, his, his stature was elevated considerably in the time, but I'd come to Australia by then and I'd lost contact with a lot of, yeah. of what was happening in New Zealand, of course. I know he had the first Rolls Royce in New Zealand and the Queen had to loan off him for the Queen. I see. When the Queen came out. Well, that's <laughs> fair. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. <laughs> but he, um, yeah, he was a very, very, very good manager. Well, he had his finger on everything and he just knew it. He was made for that particular vocation. Yeah, he was. He mm. was. Yeah. I remember when I went back, to have my albums put onto CDs the one thing I wanted to do was go into the Auckland Library because I knew they had a set up there of profile of mine I went in and the lady who runs the whole library came over and said oh my gosh I was one of your biggest fans and come into the storeroom and there was this cool room and they pulled out this huge oh, can you say like a, a pulley box or something no no, no it no. was like a pulley thing oh, you yeah, know, okay. with all the different things on it all the different financial how, records the um, how lucky to have so many hit records that you're on a convey yeah, belt on the labels <laughs> but it was just a made paper work was what was really interesting yes. and you saw that Phil had connections all around the world to any publicity that was about myself or any of his artists would be sent to him so anywhere in the world so that scrapbooks were around about 10 12 15 scrapbooks full of things yes. and his son actually had donated them when he died so was it exciting to know that you were going to record and release a record and your parents would have been chuffed wouldn't they it was exciting it was fun but I think that made it real fun everybody was so nice I, well I found that I've heard other things from other people but I found everyone so nice so easy to be around and it was a joy I mean who wouldn't want that at 17, 16, 17, say 17, going in and you're doing all this stuff and you're getting clothes and my mother made a lot of my clothing but I'd be getting shoes made for me, hats made for me and it was the 60s, you know, so yes. it was kind of like yes. such an incredible time to be able to dress up and have fun. Because it was more than music. It became a youthful social phenomenon. It changed the way we went about our ordinary lives. We changed hairstyles, we changed clothing. We, did. we had more disposable income at that time and we looked after ourselves as opposed to my Mum and Dad actually sort of forking out and keeping us exactly. locked into an That's old attitude. Exactly. That's such a good point. That's such a good point. Mm. It's so true. And I got everything I wanted. I was so spoiled. You know, I could walk in and get jackets and things and they would just be paid for. And so it's like fantasy world, really. And they gave you a salary as well? Yeah. You <laughs> had everything. Uh, here I'll in Australia, I had a girl called Karen who used to drive me around and she also looked after all my laundry and she was like my social secretary. Actually, Graham Dent was the one that organised yes, that. Yes. Graham, Because Phil knew in New Zealand I couldn't go any further than I was going. So he got Graham Dent to look after me. Graham Dent was a publicist. He managed the bowl in Sydney where I worked briefly before the Dave Miller set and where we talked about that with Sandy just before. But Graham was a publicist that was really high profile, worked for Phil Warren in New Zealand, came over here and then worked for the Ivan Damon stable, the Sunshine Artists, and very, very good at keeping those artists in the headlines. Yes. And there was no one quite like Graham Dent, but a character, an eccentric character, and sometimes you just have to wonder how truthful he was being with yeah. some of the things that he, that he proposed. <laughs> but he was really, he was instrumental in Normie. Yes, he was. And all the others, you know, that were around at the time. He really looked after us really well. Normie Rowe, of course. Normie Rowe, yeah. He was very closely associated with, that did all of the music press in the daily newspapers in mm. Sydney. And he had a very close in to all those people. They were his drinking buddies as well. Exactly. So <laughs> yeah. It worked. <laughs> there it did. Many times walking in there and there was a whole 
stream of people, you know, Harry Miller and a lot of different people. Yes. Were you still doing schooling at that time? or Because no. you were a dental assistant as yep, well. Yeah. I was schooled in a private school in England and when I got to New Zealand, I just felt I was repeating what I'd already done in England. So I said to mum and dad, I really am frustrated th- with this and they thought it was good for me to maybe go out and research something. So they thought a dental assistant. So they gave me the job. I got a job as a dental assistant and I stand it. What made them think... I don't know, they wanted me to be the girl next door, get married, yeah. children, and do everything that mum and dads would like it for their but daughter. But all our parents wanted to do that. No yeah. one would ever contemplate going into show business, youth show business. No. It just wasn't done. You had to have a career job. I mean, yeah. it, it was okay to play at a dance on Saturday night or something, yeah. but in truth, you didn't make a career out of something like that. It was most untoward. <laughs> You'll never make it. What was your dad? Computer engineer, actually, and it was really funny because I remember him getting all these books sent out from England, which were all computer books and he was a specialist in New Zealand as far as computers was So was he doing that back in England as well? Yes. I think more so for him that his mother had moved to New Zealand years and years before that and she was getting older wanted to spend time around her. My grandmother, she just wanted to go out to New Zealand she had this thing about being in New Zealand so I mean I was again too young to have even been in a discussion related to that Well it was a typically Antipodean country not only did we have the same language and culture, we had the same cars physically, we did a lot of things that absolutely absolutely ate the old country yeah. and we were the perfect antipodean lot to sort of embrace that old way and yes. that old school yes. so if you came out from the old world or the mother country you didn't feel a foreigner for the very simple reason it was too much like what you'd left at home anyway yeah 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 that's good good point you were shattered as you would have been having to move all the way over there you broke oh, off I was with you yeah I yeah actually tried to run away i did <laughs> i went and stayed at my girlfriend's house well she was just around the corner i mean the 15 year old you know they knew exactly where i was Stupid tell me when you were really young before the beatles yes uh, uh, because if you've loved music you've loved it ever since you'll be able to turn yes. the knob on a radio like me yes well who were you listening to well pre- my dad beatles? was a guitarist he played bass guitar and it was in a, a band and my mum was a really good singer right. and she sang at home for herself you know being Italian they sing all those Amore songs oh, oh. and dad played Stan Getz and right. Django Reinhardt right. and so there was always music and my mum took me off to dance you know tap and yes. ballet and all that sort of thing which young girls do and I think it was just an accumulation of all that sort of stuff so you'd be listening also to people like Connie Francis and yeah. Brenda Lee and yeah. people like that but see my favourite when I first got into New Zealand one of my favourite singers well it was Otis Redding and Nina Simone they were the people I loved Loved. I really loved the right. music. You actually timed it for a very good time that I see in that it was a stage where, probably thanks to the British invasion, that there was a lot of girls starting to be really prominent. Yeah. I mean, your name's Sandy, Sandy Shaw. Yeah. Um, Silla, Dusty Silla, Springfield. Silla, Dusty, Silla Black, and people of that ilk. And it seemed to be healthy for girls in New Zealand. The band I joined, the Playboys, Dinah Lee had been in that when she yes. was Diane Jacobs. I replaced her when she left and turned professional. And I got to see her. I remember sitting down in front of our radio working out the lyrics for Blame It On The Bossa Nova by Edie Gourmet for, for one of the Playboy things that she was going to fantastic. do. Fantastic. But there seemed to be a lot of girl singers that were really making it in the forefront at that time, along with you, like Lynn Barnett and Christine Barnett. Yeah, Barnett, and yeah. There was Alison Durbin and there was the Chicks. And Oh, the Chicks were amazing. I, so I stood in for Sandy Shaw when she came out to New Zealand because she couldn't make rehearsals, so I had to stand in for her to do her rehearsals. No shoes? No shoes. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I took one off. Oh, you did. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm the, only joking. The, the ultimate compromise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, but no, it was a great time. Great yeah. time, great memories, great memories. D- how did you get the name Sandy then, Rosalie? Well, they thought Rosalie wasn't kind of a commercial enough name, so Sandy Shaw was in vogue, so they thought Sandy would be a better name for me to have. And, and they you know. cut the son off. Yes, Sandy Edmonds. It's no. a nice ring to it. it is. Think, I've got to say something here. I've seen some things out on the internet. Yeah. The one that fascinates me is a picture of you in Christchurch at the Edmunds Shorterized oh, yes. Factory. <laughs> Thank you. There was a big factory in Christchurch that was renowned for its foodstuffs. If anybody was going to have a publicity shot, it would have to be Sandy Edmonds in the grounds of the Edmunds <laughs> Shorterized slogan, Food Place. And you know who got that together? Phil Warren. Oh, Phil did Phil. It. Also, too, um, that became the mascot to the Navy in New Zealand. So I was their royal mascot and also was a mascot for Qantas. Oh. Well, then, sorry, then it was Air New Zealand. Right. I shouldn't say Qantas. Air New Zealand. Right. So Phil was constant and this is what he was like he's constantly putting yeah. you into places where you'd be getting publicity 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 and of course cheaper flights for him to pay for me to go up backwards and forwards because i was doing that maybe once every two weeks backwards and forwards to yes. australia new zealand australia new zealand yes you would have been did you actually play a place called the laredo in christchurch 
rings a bell because I did Christchurch and I, that one of the biggest places to do. Y- yeah, the reason I ask, of course, it's a pet baby for me because we were the ones as the Playboys after Dinah Lee that actually set that up and it became one of the greatest success stories out of the 60s into the 70s it, that Christchurch had ever had. There was other successful places. This was a mega, mega place at noon and to play it was just a dream come Fantastic. true. Fantastic. I can't mm. even remember it. Mm. Can't remember that. You're too busy. Most probably yeah. flying to Japan and yeah. Hong Kong and all those yeah. yeah, I was flying a lot. I just want to ask, how quickly did you adjust to New Zealand life? It would have taken some time, yeah, wouldn't it? it yeah, did. To make friends and all that. It was lucky for me, I met, because we came over by boat, of course, in that time. Which was was how long? Six weeks. Six weeks. It wasn't leaky either. (laughs) (laughs) But it was quite amazing, because I met a girl on there, and we were both in bell-bottom jeans with a thing to wear in England, you know, at the time, bell-bottom jeans with buttons up the side. And she had brought a little portable record player. So we'd sit there and we'd play these records and dance and have fun. So Mm. I met like mind on that boat lynn her name was and it was lovely it was great but to get there and then sort of have to adjust to school and all that sort of stuff new zealand had a real wonderful innocence about it what we did together as musicians or entertainers was just well i saw it as being absolutely fabulous it was really easy it was a totally different thing insofar as that we didn't get television till well after australia you got it here in in australia for the 1956 50s, yeah. game the, the olympic games new zealand was in the early 60s and most people didn't have it until it was well into the 60s all of us in the Mersey Beat era, in the Beat Group era were doing our interpretation of what we thought it might be like yeah. and that included the fashions that went with it. Yeah. So, so Kiwis actually sort of cemented their own particular niche because they didn't see it for real. The only thing that would happen every now and again is you'd see something about pop music in a news flash if you went to the movies and yeah. they used to have a, a news thing. So we were having to make it up. So we were all scheming what it might be like and and trying to interpret it that same way. I think we were exploring our own avenues. You had an idea of what was going on, but you were exploring your own avenues. Yes. And that allowed you to grow in the way you wanted to grow. Well, the other thing that's important is you've got to take in mind that the Maori culture is one of music. Oh, yeah. And it's really been embraced by people over many, many years. So that's why you've got so many successful Maori people that have been in show business. But it's as much a part of their life as having bread or a glass of beer yeah, or something absolutely. like that. And it's spilled over into the rest of the nation as well. It did. That's why they hold their entertainers on, in such high regard. Yeah. It's they used to have the Leo De Castro and he was, what was the name of the place, Palladium? Was it? Top 20. Fantastic. And Leo was just amazing. He was a really, had that gutsy, Maori, strong voice and he was such an entertainer. Everybody would stop and just mouths would be open when he was there. And he came to Australia too. Yes, he, he did. did. He made oh, a big name did. for himself. He yes. did. And then he just sort of disappeared, I think, from what it sounds. You've got to work at it to become something. Getting back to TV, so was that your own show? No. Sounds of Sandy. John yeah. Barningham. He was really good at what he did and had a few different four-part shows and he gave me one and I played four different parts in that show so I'd be in 1920s and you know you'd move into different eras and I also did a children's show over there for a short okay. while too John Barnigan Come On was a pop show everybody kind of worked on that show because it brought in the latest music from England and we would have to do copy yes. versions yeah. of everything Pete okay. Sinclair was the host John was the producer well if I've got my facts right Pete was actually an Australian but he made his name in New Zealand oh, uh, I uh, know. But, but the original show around about 1965 launched the librettos who have a huge Huge track record here in Australia. <laughs> While he and Brian Peacock and Mick Rogers, they were associated with Normie and went to England and that sort of thing. You you broke your angle before your TV debut, is that right? Not break it, a sprain, sprain pretty badly. It. Yeah. Enough not to appear or Well what happened? I ended up in hospital a couple of times, actually. But one of the times that was worse than that was when I was put in hospital because I got bronchial pneumonia. And they said I was being overworked. And I was in the room next to Marianne Faithful. When she tried to kill herself. Yeah, (laughs) so you had Mick Jagger going past all the time. But I didn't have very much to do with Mick Jagger, but very much in the early days. You supported. I did the Stones, yeah. Yeah, the Rolling Stones. Stones. No, I was just on the tour, overwhelmed. But I had the best outfit, so I knew I was up to grade, you know. They were lovely. I really liked them as guys. Guys, especially Brian Jones, I thought he was a great guy, great guy, and toured with them on the bus. And said, look, you're a teenager. Everybody knows that band. It's yes. like touring with the, yes. the Beatles. It's like you. Everybody wanted to know who you are. I met Gene Pitney too. He was quite sweet at the time. I think it was Graham Dent that set that up, and we were all having yes. drinks together. All that sort of stuff is just way out, you know, when you're, yes. you're young and having dinner with David Bowie with a group of people. All these things are happening. It's like, whoa, what's? Where does this come from? You know? You're, yes. Was there at that time? Was there time to reflect, or were you too young? Young to reflect, or it was a roller coaster. 
environment was all happening. There was never dull moments. So, you know, you're either in one country or another country doing all these different things. And I suppose I became very... Um, yeah, I suppose I became... Just wanted to know what else was out there in life rather than just what was rock and roll and music. There seemed to be a bigger world and I yes. just wanted to experience the bigger world. You were so huge. Tell the listeners, just in case they don't know, that you were probably the biggest female singer. You had the looks as well. You were the blonde, Yeah, but blonde there was show. also Dinah. Dinah Lee was really big there too. Yeah, but Dinah came to Australia very early Very in the early, piece. Yeah, yeah. She didn't quite... Cement... We're more a Sandy fan here. <laughs> oh, that's it. Well, she didn't quite cement it to the same level that you did because after a few hits, she actually came She came, came straight over out here, here yeah. Mm. And I think Alison moved over as well. Yes, she did. To let you know why people did that is that particularly in Sydney in those days, they had the licensed league clubs and RSL clubs good orchestras, good backing bands, etc. And because of the pokies and alcohol, which New Zealand didn't have at all, there was a much more lucrative way of, of cementing a real career for yourself. And if you're good enough, I mean, you had a real career in clubs, particularly in New South Wales. And that's why they came across, of course. Because, I mean, I did the last tour with the Howard Morrison Quartet, and they're legendary. Oh, Howard Morrison was an amazing man. He was just so kind, so organised, and he was there backing you up. He was like a, a big brother. He was a visionary. Yeah. He really was. He was a visionary, yeah. and he would there support the people that he felt he could help. Um, but I, as, as I've mentioned earlier before this particular broadcast, there's various different compilations that Sandy and I and others sort of share, and as a consequence of that, I like to collect them. I'm that nostalgic yeah. and silly. <laughs> uh, I get to hear these things these days. Like you said, you were travelling to Australia, so was Phil Warren, was he trying to break you big in Australia as well? Was I that... knew he couldn't do that. It wasn't his demand, so he gave that hand o that over. But Philip would stay in New Zealand. The only time he ever came with me was when we went to Tokyo, went to Japan to work, and I did television and that over there and he came with his offsider and they stayed around me because they knew I was too young to be left on my own but no Phil didn't really have anything to do with Australia he knew what was going on here and he knew how to deal with it but he had the whole of New Zealand under his palm of his hand he knew what yeah. was going on so he knew his territory and he didn't want to step on anybody else's territory and Graham Dent had his levels and he moved into other there was other people mentioned to for me to go and work with that stage I decided I really I'd, I'd kind of had enough because you started very young. When I came over to here to Australia, I could walk into Merivale, which was the place where everybody bought clothes. The house stuff. of Merivale. Absolutely. <laughs> Fantastic <laughs> place. And we, we loved it. Could walk in and just see the best leather jackets with all the fringing and the studded jackets. And, and I could go, I'll have that, I'll have that, I'll have that, I'll have that. And it was all paid for. So it was a luxury for me to be able to do all the things I wanted to do. And I mean, why would anybody want to give that up? unless they decided in their life that they knew something else was going on in the world. And it was like that. I just thought, hmm, there's more to life than just music, rock and roll. I want to investigate other music, sitar, and other things that were going on around the place. So that's when I decided, OK, off you go. Was there a moment or was there a slow, steady build-up? No, there was a moment. There was a moment. What yeah. was the moment? Can you and tell the us? the moment was, I was, I, I was just sitting talking to a few people and we were talking about India. And to me, it sounded like the most amazing place. And I thought, right, time to go over there and have a look. And I was able to, because I had the finances at the time to do that. And that just escalated into other places. And of course, I'd met somebody that I wanted to travel with, who was a film director come... Was this writer. Michael? Yeah, yeah, Michael. He was a, an amazing writer and not so much into music. It was all art. He was a fabulous painter. And so it was like, yeah, there's a challenge there of something else. So on with the new adventure. And you were how old? Were At you? that stage, I was, oh, well, gosh, let me think. I was about 22, I think it was, okay. 22. Mm. So the parents knew your parents? Well, my parents were okay about okay. it because I was with Michael and we got married. Um, I've been just a little ceremony in New Zealand yeah. and then off to India, overland via all the other places. And then from India, I wanted to go to Bhutan. That was the place where I really wanted to be. I don't know why or what for. I just wanted to be in Bhutan. Back then, how did you even have heard of a place called Bhutan? Bhutan. Well, I honestly don't know. I picked up some There was books. no internet, was there? No, <laughs> no, there wasn't. There was none of that. There was books. There was definitely books. I picked up a book and I was reading about it and I just thought, this place sounds absolutely like a Shangri-La, almost like a place of paradise. And went to the Bhutanese mission in India, but they wouldn't let me in because I was a girl alone. At the time, Michael was doing other things. We'd gone up to 14,000 feet. He'd gone up higher. And I stayed in Tangbushe, which was a little place right up in the Himalayas, and stayed 
stayed there for a while and it was just it was beyond being able to talk about some of the experiences there that you visually and emotionally feel so when i wanted to go to bhutan i wasn't allowed in because no westerner had been in there except people that have like notaries or people that have anything to do with culture certain cultures to do with plants and things like that and so botanists i had to turn around and not go there and i still haven't been there to this day although i've been back to india i've been back to nepal about three or four times and i have not been to bhutan so Ask me that one. Yeah, mm. why didn't you go back? I why didn't you try? Because really you can get in there. Absolutely. <laughs> and I could get in there. And for some reason, I haven't gone back there. But it's like Bali. I was in Bali. There was only eight tourists in Bali when I first went there. And You um, mean Chappelle wasn't there yet? <laughs> none of those people were there yet. Eight tourists. And there was people living there, a few people living there, but there was only eight tourists. No electric light. The men wore bhaktiks. There was no hotels. It was just quite exquisite because you lived with a family and it was just amazing and to now go back there I'd have to go much further out to see yes, yes. and have the same experience if I could get that experience again but yeah it was just a journey I wanted to go on and then it was time to return which is about eight years mm-hmm. and you were still married to years. Michael at that time or yeah, not yeah you're still yeah, okay yeah yeah and yeah well as you say I had sort of had a little bit more of a dabble in music but nothing really came to it I just didn't feel it anymore and people used to say to me don't you miss it enormously And I'd say, well, no, because I did what I wanted to do and I experienced what I wanted to experience. And it was a whole different world. And as I was saying to Dave, my daughter, who's only 22, has experienced more in the last three years musically because she's experimenting with all sounds and sound effects and beatboxing and a cappella and lots of different things, loop pedals and these different things that just go on now. And you don't necessarily... Well, I wasn't such a great singer. I think I had more presence than anything. But the kids today, they're amazing. Oh, yeah. Amazing. Uh, so, is she planning a career, or has she got a oh, career in music? Oh, she was doing. I yeah. mean, she was using loop pedals and about two and a half, three years ago, and doing all kinds of a cappella and fabulous. But she's decided to change that at the moment. She's learning sign language, and she will dabble in music. But whatever takes her to a place where she's happy, that's all we wish for our families: is happiness. You can't buy it. Is she no. trying to get to Bhutan as well? Is she? <laughs> no, she's not really interested no. in going no. to India. I don't think just yeah. yet. But for me, it was just I really wanted a change, and that was an amazing massive change. What thought got into young Sandy Edmonds to embark on that adventure? I think I'd had enough of the industry, music and everything at the time and I knew there was just something else that was drawing me along that was sort of saying widen out see other it's it's, it's like people who want to go into um, mexico and see what happened in the Mayan civilizations and all that sort of thing i just wanted to experience what was happening over in india and i'd heard about people like krishnamurti and amazing minds that worked more about not just the physical elements of life that there's much more to life than that. So for me to go to India was very, like, it was in your face. My first day in Calcutta, one minute I'm standing on this ground, which is lovely ground, but lots of very sad people that were hungry and, and there's a lot of poverty there. And the next three hours later, I'm up to my knees in water. It is just monsooned, you know, and it was like, whoa, what's going on? But things where I'd never experienced things that I'd never seen, things that I'd never even heard about. I'd never even seen half of it on television. My world was all show business from the time I got up to the time I went to sleep. Everything. Wasn't we didn't it? sleep, did we? No. <laughs> the time we didn't In my sleep. case, no, not very often. <laughs> exactly, you know. But you, you see, it's interesting, one of the questions you've just asked, Sandy, there gets to be, after a certain level of success, a sameness, and you just keep going round and round and round on the same cycle. It might sound exciting to a lot of people that haven't achieved it, but you end up sort of running your book and you're going to that place at a certain time, you're coming back in another eight weeks' yeah. time and so on. It just goes round in a cycle, which becomes a bit nine to five, and some of the magic falls away. Also, uh. when you're on your own, if you're a solo act and you're going off to places where you're spending three months in a country and you're on your own and you don't speak the language and you don't know anybody, it's very lonely. And you remember, I was an only child anyway, and I'd learned how to occupy myself on my own easily. But it just got to the stage where I just thought, no, I don't want to do this anymore. Oh. Could have taken it to London. That was my next stage go to London and experience some other things I had avenues there I knew people who were involved with Led Zeppelin I knew people involved with all these other people and I could have opened up in that country but I just didn't want to you do didn't that. want to do it I have a theory that when you become very 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 successful in your field that you're sitting there on top of the heap and you think to yourself well there's got to be more and plus it's the human thing to well, want that's more India, isn't it that's India that's where the whole Beatles were 
their elements were there for a while. So for me, it was the same thing. And that changed my thinking when I was up at 14,000 feet. I mean, I spent a lot of time there just contemplating. The air was very thin up there, though, Rosalie. Oh, it was amazing. <laughs> I was why I didn't want to go any higher because people, it was a doctor that was just coming down through there who'd got the bends and it's serious stuff when you go up there. But I was happy to just actually walk around and see what was going on around there. And the seeds must have been planted or something must have been planted in me at that stage about Bhutan as well. But I came back and I'd went on with life just doing fashion. I like fashion. I was always involved in fashion because music and fashion yeah. as a girl goes together, even with the guys. I mean, you guys were in kind of pinstripe things. and We had Edwardian's outfits yeah. in the very early stage. Of it's an expression of something about yourself. Well, you know? fashion was a big part of my first band, the Playboys, which became the New Zealand Birds. Our bass player was an apprentice tailor. And I had a girl called Diana Firth who came from the Firth family in New Zealand. I think they were concrete family or um, something like that. And she was doing things that were like Ozzie Clark. There were chiffons that she would print them all and I'd be wearing all this amazing stuff and I'd have all those floppy hats that are all out now and all these kind of things that are right in now. I'd be wearing all that sort of stuff yes, then, you know, yes. because people wanted to make stuff for you. Yeah. Wanted you have interesting things and they'd give you these things and you'd be wearing heaps of jewelry. I remember having butterflies on the end of my eyelashes, little butterfly wings on the end of my eyelashes, hand-painted signs on my face and arms. And we were just experimenting, but it was absolutely mad. It was yes. great. And so this was like Ozzy got very little chiffon pants, very wide, all hand-painted. And it was just a remarkable time to be involved yes. in. I don't know if, I think the competition now is very, intense for young entertainers yeah and there are some amazing entertainers on there but a lot of the time they don't come to fruition if you find that you know, maybe the second who comes second or third yes. they may be the ones that actually make it in the industry because they have the gum the movement the wanting to get out there and win you're jumping from one thing to another very very quickly where a lot of the musicians that are really great musicians and that have taken their time to come through before we forget we better mention Shibuku oh, fashion. Yeah, Shibuki, Shibuki. Yeah. Shibuki. <laughs> I don't know much about fashion I'm afraid no, Rosalie Oh, yeah, I yeah. love it. So I evolved to that. It took a, quite a few years, but I decided to put my head to it. And Shibuki started off with a girlfriend, Shelley, and we were doing children's clothing, very funky little fur coats and jackets and stuff, which even people walk in now years and years and years later and say they're the best clothes. But she decided to move on to something else, and I decided to move on into what I knew was interesting. And so I find lots of very interesting one-off things, unique and not expensive, because I think people don't have to pay lots and lots of money for things that are unique anymore. So you were at the sole proprietor? Now. Yeah, I okay. am now, and I love it. And I love being with people who want to brighten their lives and find something that suits them so they can just smile. I mean, we lack so much of that in the world at the moment is happiness and kindness and generosity. And I like that thought because it's away from the uniform mentality. Yeah, exactly. And it gives people an independent look. They walk out and they know they're feeling really good. But today, well, it expresses their personalities, doesn't it? Well, it gives them something to express, mm. and then that extends into something else mm. where you give them a little inch and they move into the mile. Mm. These days, it's really, really tough for a lot of people. They're suffering through yeah. financial difficulty and they're suffering through all this war and terror. And it's sad because we need to stay on top of that. We yeah. need to stay positive and give as much emotional positivity to everyone as we possibly can. Mm. And do you have a website? No, I don't as no? yet. Okay. I don't as yet. I find that people come in and they've been recommended, recommended, recommended and because I have a lot of one-offs I find it difficult that if other people want to get it on the web they can't so I will get a web just to show what the shop's like have like virtual shop inside where does the name come from Shibuki is a when you drop a pebble in the river it's the ongoing ripple yeah and my life has just developed more and more and more I more look introspectively now you think I mentioned to you that I'm a Buddhist so does that mean you special diet, vegetarian? No, no, no? I, look, everyone to their own in it. Buddhism is a philosophy and it's for you to train your mind. If you can, train your mind into a place where you feel good about oneself. So you can actually, that will then radiate, like a shibuki, radiate to all others. It's deep, but there's a lot of depth in there. But, you know, it's not the time to talk about that right now because <laughs> it's another subject all the Well, it's worked for you. Yeah. I mean, I could just tell it in your demeanour. You, 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 you look happy. <laughs> yeah. But that's because you're no, seeing us, so I'll be like, all right, all right, yeah, calm down. Yeah, I'm also down. blushing all the time, too, because I've got two gorgeous men in here. Uh, uh, but no, life is amazing. So how do we get hold of Shibuki? Your address is? It's 537 Main Street, Mordialic. Which is actually in the Peen Highway, isn't it? Is it is between the Commonwealth Bank and the ANZ Bank, and it's right in the middle there. And I remember a Feng Shui lady came in one day and said to me, oh, 
Very good. Between two banks. <laughs> you can bank on it. <laughs> they get the money out of the bank and just they happen to see your shop right there in the you middle. You know how many women come in and go, I was just going to the bank and mm. I just had to pop in and look at it now. I've already bought two outfits. <laughs> Great. And the shop's been there for 14, 14 years? 14 yeah, okay. years now. You and know, before that? Before that I had Domain Road, South Yarra. I had a brilliant house. It was a 25-room mansion um, that was let to me by the head bursar of Melbourne Grammar very kindly for very little so you can afford to go to Bhutan now Rosalie <laughs> no 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 you know what in the end I think it's important to share out wealth if you can but I do believe in the consequences of your actions and I think that if you can share you do share you know sometimes it's not possible but even if you share in a way that you see someone on the street who needs help or someone is suffering some way you can support around you your friends that goes out again like a shibuki it starts there and it just keeps moving out and moving out and moving out it's got a bit pretty selfish though haven't we well it is a money orientated society mm. i mean everything that comes down to just money when you look at what's going on at the government with climate change and that sort of thing at the moment we're more concerned about what is happening overseas with the destruction but we also need to be aware of what's happening with our planet because it's suffering Yes, that's why people like you and I still talk about our very early days, because it was the sheer innocence of it. Yeah. It was for fun. I mean, no one thought about a real career or lasting very long, and we certainly weren't governed by money. We were there because we absolutely loved it. We lived in the moment. Mm. That was very much it. And mm. that is the philosophy of Buddhism. Mm. You live in the moment. You contemplate that moment. You actually... Oh, it's a long story. I could go on raving, raving, raving about this, but I don't think at this stage it's the right thing. No, we better get to a bit of music. I've had a friend of mine on the show and I mentioned I'm getting Sandy Edmonds on the show and he remembered Climax. He's a musician. Oh my gosh, he is. So I'm assuming that maybe he supported Climax, maybe. What years were Climax around? Oh, was it, do you remember? Gosh, I can't remember. I really can't remember. Did you record at all this Climax? No. Just playing where? Just Melbourne playing, is? Well, we did actually play in Sydney at the, oh gosh, what was the name of the place? Manly Vale Hotel. And yeah, we worked there a lot and there was a lot of really good... What good sort of material did you do? The Sandy Edmonds back catalogue? No. No, 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 no. We did a covers. We did a lot of original material, but we did covers, you know. Take a pinch of white man. Wrap it up in black skin, that sort of thing. Blue mink. Have you written songs yourself? No, no. Yeah. No, I've written a lot of material, but mm. not songs. I write a lot. But So we did that, we did a lot of that, and had the band, and then that was actually where I made the decision to change. So it must yeah. have been around about the 70s, so 71. The boys were really very upset with me because we had some pretty big gigs lined up. Oh. I just decided that it was time to go. But, yeah, and life goes on. I picked up on one of the songs on the, the CD that Nick lent me, and it's You Got the Power of Love, and I like that particular song. Did you song. like you, that? You do oh, the Nancy nice. Wilson arrangement. Actually, that same song was the very first song that the Dave Miller set ever recorded in really? Australia. Did you, oh, you did but it's that. never been released. But I did the Everly Brothers arrangement of it, if you've ever heard it. No. Very driving bass and guitar. Mm. She does a more club, nearly swing version, which Good. you've done exceptionally well, because I have Nancy's version in my record oh, thank collection. You. And you do that very well. It just fascinated me, because it's one of my favourite songs. Isn't it? Because it's enjoyable? still in my library. You know? Well, you should bring it out and play it. Um, Sandy, just going back, did you ever have a choice of your material? No. It was very much up to this is what we want you to do yeah. occasionally i'd say no i don't want to do that but there was a couple of songs i never wanted to do and i was made to do going ahead a little bit and i may have been a bit older maybe if i was in the mid 70s or earlier 70s when i left because in the bands we got a choice of course we would all sit around and discuss those sort of things but when recording at that age now it looks like they'd sort of try to cover all, all bases yeah including bizarre novelty songs as well but what i really do like is your version of come see me the pretty things that's fantastic oh, that's they were outrageous, weren't they? Well, I saw a black and white clip, and it was 1964. And who was the the lead singer? Was it who was the lead singer? David was it May? Was it Dick? Phil May? Phil May. He had hair down the middle of his back. Yeah. He did. When everyone else had hair just just over their ears. Yeah. And he had it down, couldn't believe uh, it. They were deported out of New Zealand, do you know? <laughs> <laughs> that, that, the were, hair? Was it the hair? Yeah, that, well, no. they were so drunk on stage and they started throwing bottles and stuff like that that the police decided that they were too much of a threat to society, so they exported them very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Got that. I remember Clive Corson, who was, you know, also uh, manager of Bad Company and also worked with Led Zeppelin. When he was in New Zealand, he had hair as long as mine is now, and my mother loved him. She thought he was the best thing since sliced bread because he was such a polite young man. But his hair it was extremely long. Despite the long hair, your mother still liked him? Loved him. 
absolutely loved him. She thought he was the nicest. He would ring her up every birthday, and unfortunately he's passed now. He passed about eight years ago now. When they had his funeral, I was surprised that he'd set up a rugby club in New Zealand for all the young kids in his area near Avalon. Yeah, it was just, he was a good person. And they were the people in that day, most of the people in that particular period of time, were good people. Just a last couple of questions, Rosalie. Sandy Edmonds, man, you gave it another shot with the Sandy Edmonds band, yes, yes. according to your line yes, of notes, I yeah? did. It was just a, a have a go at what was going on, and again, it just wasn't meant to be. I'm a real believer that when things finish, they finish. Here in Melbourne, were you doing that? Here in Melbourne. And when was that? Would have been 30 years ago, something like that. It eludes me all the time frames of these things. All of the stuff that you recorded over time, and it's fairly significant, mm. have you got a couple of real favourites that you're really proud of? Well, there's a few. I love That's onions. Yeah. You had to say that. <laughs> Sorry. You had to, didn't you? You yes. nasty little person. <laughs> I'm the host, you know. I can I'm say the, anything. You're like, look, you know what? There's quite a lot of them. I, I really enjoyed working. I really enjoyed it. I would love to have done original material. Well, it's nice when you think about things and you think, okay, I've um, in the Auckland Library, there's all this information about my being part of that revolution. Yes. You know what I mean? That you had a very significant part in that, and that's the reason I posed the question about have you got some that you really like? I mean, you must have. There's things that I've done that I really like and I'm very proud of. Oh. Obviously, Mr. Guy Fawkes. There are things that I think that you do extremely well, and I just wondered if. It's well, I love. I, I do when I walk in the room. I like that. Searches, yeah, I thought that was really good. And I worked with the search. Well, I didn't work with. Are you supported them, support on the tour? Yeah. Support them on the tour. And um, you know what? There's so many good ones on there. I think you do I a really good job of Sunny. Yes, yes, uh, and good, at least he's reminding me. The reason I say that is it's got so many key changes. In, it's it, sweet, isn't it? Well, some singers, if they just get slightly in flat on the, those yeah. key changes, it sounds awful. Yeah. And you've nailed each one of those beautifully. By the time I get to Phoenix, I did that on Bandstand, and they did their first video on that on a train, and I was in a train station. And I remember feeling so good that day. My hair was good, my whole body felt good, and the song was really, really nice. I have had so much going on from that time of leaving England through to now. It amazes me. Honestly, there's so much going on, and sometimes you'd just be, you know, it's like you'd be doing a gig and you'd be meeting all these people, and you'd walk into a party with the Eagles and you're meeting all. So much. So much. It's just like overload sometimes. It's like you just remember the certain things you want to remember and the rest of it just consider the past. And yeah. sometimes I read some of the things that have been written about me and I think, did I really do that? Did I really? Did I actually do that? Maybe that's why you drifted off into the Northern Hemisphere too much too soon is... One of the Barrymore people said. Maybe, who yeah. knows? I don't know, but there was definitely a calling to move away from. Yeah, as I said before, sometimes it's just going around in circles. And, yeah, and, and, that's and, a good and, point. and then you sort of say to yourself, like you have obviously done, there's got to be a bit more to it, and I've got a lot of life left, you know, yeah. so you do something. And people still recognise you. That's the thing I, I go through. I recognise you in the shop. Nice oh. of you. I want to mention the CD, the sound of Sandy CD. I love that. I've that's fantastic. That was and huge collots on the back. I like that one too. Is that the one that banned you? You got oh, banned yeah, from TV. I did. You're wearing a tiger... What tiger is print bra. Oh, tiger bra. print bra. Tiger print bra. You know what? Phil Warren was phenomenal like that. Just Take anything and turn it into publicity. You know that. Yes, and Graham did, took it to even a greater degree. Yeah, he did. Mm. He could do anything. And that's when, as I said, a lot more personality, but maybe not strong content vocally. So when you've got somebody who can pick it up and move it into a place where you're just getting so much public, constant. And I mean, it's like getting a record played. I don't know how you get a record played today. I don't know if you have to pay to have records played, records or CDs or whatever you're playing these days, because I believe they're moving back to records again. So I don't know if people have to pay to have that done or whether it just gets done naturally. They've done a wonderful job because they've really packed the CD. It's nearly about 76 minutes. And Did Grant put that together, Grant Gillanders? He helped put it together. He helped, he helped. Clive was the one at Instria. He said, look, you know, you've right. got to put... Oh, your Clive stuff. was alive at the time. Yeah, yeah he was yeah. alive. We lost track of each other because he was all over the world and I was doing other things. And he sent a private investigator to find me. Oh, wow. He was keen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. he wanted yeah. because we were really close friends. I just made it down to Morty Alec. <laughs> yeah. No, well, he didn't. At this stage, he couldn't find me. And it was the person that was living in the house with me. I had a journalist living with me. And he knew how much I felt about Clive. And, you know, he'd asked me all these things about the whole career thing. And he one day without me knowing, he'd gone through and found through Ozzy Osbourne, one of his players, that they knew Clive. So consequently, they got on to him that way. And then I get a phone call. I nearly fell off my chair. And it was Clive saying, hey, it's me. And I've gone, Ugh. you know, I was so excited, but I was also very teary too. And then um, he said, look, I really think you should be putting your albums onto CD because they're just sitting 
and I'll get onto it for you and make sure because he was in New Zealand at that time. He was living there. He'd given up all that was back. and everything and made a lot of money and bought a lot of land and he settled into what he loved was husbandry. So he wanted to do that again. I think he was originally English, but he'd oh, lived okay. there since he was a child, a little child. And he was on a farm when he was 12, 13 and he loved it. So he wanted to go back to that. So we gave him a bit of a taste of back into the industry again, yes. you know. So he got onto Stebbings and he got onto a different, and Grant, of course. Right. Grant was key as well and Grant was amazing. He helped to put a lot of things together. They've done a great job and the pictures are fantastic and the dresses, like you say, that's an amazing I love it. pattern. Loved it. Yeah, it Isn't, was so a, now. Anyway, there was a, lots of a, other a, ones a, too. A, a jumpsuit. So it's well worth buying the seed. It'll oh, be I on Amazon. Do. I don't know. I'm sure it would be on Amazon.com. Yeah. You tell me how out of contact I am. I'm, mm. I'm really not connected to that, you know. But I love music. As I could go back into a studio now with Will I Am, I'd be in the studio. I told you I love him. I yeah. think he's just amazing. Absolutely amazing. My daughter shares that belief. Oh, all right. Well, on that note, well, thank you very much, Rosalie Edmondson. Thank for you. You're an absolute darling, and I appreciate coming in. You're welcome. We appreciate you coming in because it was a bit of... A <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't want to kind of go through it all again. I thought, oh, uh, it's over. You created a ruckus in New Zealand. Well, actually, it was because in New Zealand they'd said that I'd been taken by bandits in Afghanistan because we were in Afghanistan. Mm. We were in a Ford Transit. You're supposed to travel alone. We travelled alone in a Ford Transit. It was on this way to Omashari, and we stopped in the middle of the night to just have a rest. The next morning we wake up and there's a, a man all wrapped up in black and sitting in front of our van with a musket. And Michael has jumped out and sort of gone, hmm. And the guy was so friendly because they're the Kuchi tribal people and they live in the black tents. Oh, it wasn't Taliban I mean, or anything like no, that? No, 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 no. But he was protecting. They weren't invented yet, were I don't they? think they yeah, were invented yeah. yet. But there may have been little seeds in mum's womb. Mm. But he was protecting us in a way and we only found that out later, how lucky we were. And so in New Zealand it was, she's been taken by bandits or oh. she's been doing drugs or mm. something. Oh, lots of different skits. She's been holidaying in Syria. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. I'm not saying anything no. to that one. But, but um, no. We're provocative here. That's you what are, we are provocative, aren't you? And you get away with it too. <laughs> Let's hope the world turns itself around peacefully. It has to. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Thank Sandy you. Edmonds, for taking time to talk with us. Thanks, Dave, for coming back. Thank you. Lovely you to too. Mm. Cheers. Thank you.